You're checking out the Investor Shed Podcast with Nick Beveridge and Jeremy Kitchen. They're on the path to financial freedom and they're taking their community with them. Stay tuned for the best free real estate investing advice on the internet. Welcome, everybody, to the Investor Shed Podcast. My name is Nick Beveridge, and we are here, Season 2, Episode 22. And today, Jeremy Kitchen is going to announce our guest. I am. It's me, Jeremy Kitchen, co-host of the Investor Shed Podcast. Uh, today, we have our guest on. It's Colton Haker. Uh, Colton Haker is a super cool guy. Uh, I really enjoyed talking with him. Uh, Colton is actually an Enduro Cross champion multiple times over. Um, I didn't know that about him before we actually interviewed him. We just, uh, we found him at one of his R- R- REI events in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. He's a celebrity. He's a celebrity, everybody. He's a celebrity, everybody. Ooh. In the motorcycling world. Yeah, but no, he's super cool. Um, he's got a lot of disciplines, a lot of talents, and he's taking everything he's learned as far as his discipline in talents in Enduro Cross and transferred into real estate investing. Uh, we dive into his career in Enduro Cross and investing and uh, all about what he's been up to. It's a really cool episode. I enjoyed it. Yeah, if you want to learn more about extreme ownership, fucking stay tuned, because this is the one. Here we go. Grab your tacos. Enjoy. Welcome to the Investorship Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Jeremy Kitchen. How are you this morning? Nick, I'm doing so good. Hey, happy birthday, by the way. How are you doing today? Thank you. Yeah, it's a a great day so far. Um, I got some birthday gifts from my wife and kids, and they're all bag-related. Nice. Yeah. You do love bags. <laughs> I love my bags. I do now. <laughs> Speaking of bags, Colton, how are you this morning? I'm doing good, Nick. Thanks for having me, guys. Yes. Thank you for being here. All right, Jeremy, let's kick it off. Yeah. So by the way, for anyone listening, uh, Colton has more than one name. It's Colton Hacker. We have the legendary Colton Hacker in the house today. Colton, man, thank you so much for joining us. We definitely appreciate you having here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you started into real estate investing? <laughs> well, this is a long story, of course, as most people pr- can probably imagine. Um, the quick the quick version of getting into real estate was basically uh, I bought my first house, and uh, I'm a professional dirt bike racer by trade the last 15 years. And uh, I bought this house so I could train uh, for my professional racing series more easily. It was on five acres. I could build my own track. I invested in uh, in my career with this property. Well, the funny thing is I knew nothing about truly like about real estate or uh, markets or timing anything, but we had bought it in 2012, you know, and, and we all know that that was a low time to be buying property. Things were for relatively cheap compared to what they are now. Um, and, uh, and I basically did my thing using that property to race the dirt bike race series that I was doing and winning races and championships and having fun and living out my childhood dream. And uh, seven years later, I grew up a little bit, you know, I'm a couple years older, learned that uh, my house is now worth a lot more than what I paid for it. And so that was my first kind of introduction into, I didn't do anything except live in this house and use it for my childhood dream. And in the end, now it's triple, triple in value. And, uh, that was just an eye-opening experience in itself, you know? And so uh, from there, you know, yeah, we've kind of gone down the rabbit hole and we can get into that more. So um, if we could back up a little bit, I, I feel like you were humbling yourself just a little bit by <laughs> saying, yeah, a, pro- a professional. Um, but you're more than just a professional. You're like the number one world-ranked enduro racer out there, right? Is that, am I saying that wrong? Yeah, no, I mean, we could just go to quickly like the accolades instead of just trying to pump myself up. Uh, factual information. I've, I've won uh, five national Enduro Cross AMA championships and uh, three FIM World Enduro Cross championships. And then uh, I've competed in the X Games a number of times, uh, getting two silver medals in that. So that's over the course of, like I said, you know, 15 professional years. So I've had some, some good years and some good seasons throughout that. Um, and yeah, I'm, uh, it's been a blast, man. I've been able to travel the world, live, live my dream, uh, of racing a motorcycle since you're a little kid, uh, get paid to, to do that and stay in shape. And, uh, and yeah, just, um, 
my, my daily routine is, you know, riding, riding motorcycles and uh, trying to be the best I can be for that, for that length of time. Awesome. So if we could, before we switch into real estate, if we could talk a little bit more about this, because I'd love to like kind of get, what is the mindset of a person who is like at the top of not just their game, but like the game of some institution, like there's got to be more to it than just luck or drive, right? Like, can you tell us a little bit about like what, what kind of mental status you're at? Um, or what, what do you have to do to mentally prepare to be like the best of the best? Is it just, is this just way more practice than anybody can imagine? Uh, or is it more to it than that? Definitely more to it than just as much practice as you can possibly put in. Uh, I like to, at this point, you know, quality over quantity. So, uh, I am a, a family man with, uh, two, two kids and a wife and other things going on. So the amount of quality I can put into my riding and training has to be ultra focused. Now at a different point in my life, right? When I was 21 years old, you know, didn't have as many responsibilities, could really just ride bikes and have fun and was a professional at it. Yes. Like time on the bike was everything. I spent all day, every day thinking about it, obsessing over it 24, seven, 365. It just never leaves your head. If you want to be if you want to be the best at anything, I feel like that's truly what it takes. Um, and that obsession comes from love, you know, like a true, deep rooted love, passion for what you do. Um, and that will easily give you the drive to continue and get through the hard times and to see through to the good times. And, um, I think that anyone could tell you that that's, that's, that's gone like, you know, the distance and anything and, um, that there's just like a deep, deep burning inside them to, to try to achieve whatever that is. And so, um, my achievements in getting to that level, you know, it was, um, trial and error. You know, I don't say I'm a fast, quick learner by any means. Um, I probably had the skills, um, and the speed to be a world champion in my first or second year as a professional, to be honest, by the time I was 17, 18, 19 years old, I, I had the skills, I had the speed, I had the strength, I had the talent. But mentally, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't there and ready to start winning, uh, at a young age. Um, I needed to grow as a, as a person and maybe go through more pitfalls and, and have more issues. So I really started, uh, winning. And once I, once I started winning, I, I really didn't stop. I didn't let go of that feeling. So, um, that's where I kind of ended up with having all the championships and the wins was that I kind of went through a lot of rough rough runs and rough times to get there. And then once I had it, I was like, I'm not willing to let this go. And uh, I stopped making those mistakes. I learned from all my mistakes. I learned from all the pitfalls. And then I didn't let those things happen anymore. And that's why I started consistently racking up wins and championships. That's so awesome. Uh, there's a lot of cool information to unpack from that. Obviously your passion powers the drive. I think that's just so great, right? Because I mean, um, as professionals, we're bound to fail. Eventually we're bound to fail. We're bound to fail hard. Uh, it's what we do when we get up that makes us definitely though. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about that too. So, so what do you do? So when you're down, how do you find yourself getting out of those ruts? Like what did you do specifically that was different in your training that got you out of your ruts and got you into a winning mindset? Well, the funny thing is, is with racing a dirt bike, you can pinpoint, you know, what you did. You know, well, I fell down here. Okay. Well, we can recreate that situation of, the obstacle, right? Okay. Well, I crashed over a couple of these rocks and slipped out in the front end and I maybe I ended up traction on the front tire, or maybe there was my body position was off. And so the cool thing about it is that you can kind of go through these things and, and really dissect it. Right. Um, what I found was being able to dissect that stuff was a ton of information. Um, but in the end, you know, nothing was going to stop the fact that I was going to just keep pursuing that ultimate goal. Right. Sure. So yep. I never let those drive me to the point of wanting to quit or giving up. And I was never too embarrassed by making mistakes either. Right. So we all have to make mistakes and we all have to take it on the chin a little bit. And I think the more that you can become self look into yourself and critical of those mistakes, the faster you're going to be able to bounce back from those things, you know? So I find that the most of the guys that, um, that don't 
get past the mistakes or don't get to the level or don't get to a championship um, is because they are not really being truthfully honest about what is going on maybe inside their head or what they're not willing to admit to themselves, the level that they're willing to go to, right? Um, and this goes, dude, it goes so deep into, oh, yeah. into, yeah. into life, into anything you want to pursue, you know? And um, dude, I just been, I've been fortunate to be able to, to do that. And I try my best to, uh, always improve, you know, uh, daily as a, as a person and grow and, and, uh, and look at myself and how can I be better for myself and for others around me and now my wife and my kids. And yeah, so I think that's, uh, the ultimate, the ultimate non it's never, there's never an end either. Right. Right. It just keeps going. It's like the saying, like the artist is never satisfied with their painting. They're going to keep critiquing it and they're going to keep trying to grow. And like, how can I make this one thing that I made better? Uh, that's exactly what you are. You're an artist, you're a craft man. And it's, uh, it's cool to see. And it's cool to actually hear your story from you. I mean, um, obviously before you started showing up to the Coraline meetups, to be honest, I had no idea who you were. I didn't follow Enduro Cross or anything like that. But then I was like, oh, wow, like he's done a lot of cool things. We'd love to get him on this podcast and kind of talk about his journey. So yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for sharing. No worries. You know what? Also that, like you were saying that I just kind of, it, it kind of strikes me because I, I, I talk to a lot of successful people, not quite on your level, um, but what I see as like a common denominator with people is when things don't go your way, you don't blame anybody. You, you take full ownership and responsibility for what happened and you learn from it and you quickly make adjustments and move forward. And what I've found from, I, and I also know a lot of people that maybe aren't getting what they want in life uh, and they have a lot of challenges and struggles through life and they, they tend to blame people. They, bl- they blame everybody else but themselves. Um, so I just, I just wanted to point that out because you kind of mentioned that slightly that you just, you know, you take responsibility for it. You make adjustments. You don't blame anybody. You don't blame the track. You don't blame your, you know, bike. Yeah. I'll give you a really good example of that. So, um, you know, in Coeur d'Alene, you wouldn't believe how many, um, people actually ride motorcycles off road and enduro like I do. Um, there's just a really big community and uh, a lot of people here who are very much into it, which is it's really cool. So a lot of times in town, I get, I get recognized, uh, by people and it's, it's, it's surprising every time, but, uh, these parents, you know, they'll come up to me and they'll, they'll talk to me and then introduce myself. I would love for you to, you know, uh, you know, meet my 11 year old, you know, he loves dirt bikes and, and I try to be as open and, and transparent and as, and as willing to, to give advice and talk and, and seem like a good human to everyone I talk to. Right. So, um, I, I talk to them about it and I say, man, it's awesome that you got them into dirt bikes. You know, it's scary, you know, letting your kid go out there and, you know, potentially break their arm or, you know, do crazy. Just, it just, dirt bikes are dangerous, right? In the end of the day, a lot can happen. Um, and just trying to equip them with the most information and then give them the trust that they can, they can do it in the end. So that's a big part of it is giving the kid the trust, right? And so I like to explain to the parents is, What it really teaches them in the beginning is if they hit a rock and they fall down on the trail, they're not going to get, they can't, what are they going to do the rock? You know, like they could, they could be like mad at the rock for a second. Oh, that rock, you know? And it's like, well, the, the, the rock didn't do anything. The rock didn't move. What were you doing? You were staring at the rock. You were like, oh, don't hit the rock. Don't hit the, here, here comes the rock. Don't hit the rock. You know what I mean? So then they go down and they, and it teaches them immediately the difference between, I can't blame this and I'm in an, ob- in, in an object, you know, this thing is just there, you know? So I take responsibility for the action that I just had. And I think that's such an awesome thing to teach a 10 year old, an 11 year old, a nine year old, an eight year old. It's just that immediate, you know, taking responsibility for your action. And it's, a, it's, a, it's just in a lesson on a dirt bike, you know, that you can take to the rest of your life. Yeah, I think that's one lesson that is just never taught enough. Um, to kids or people in general, I feel like there's still, pl- I mean, there's like adult babies out there that still don't take responsibility for anything in life. I was going to say to, to, that, that applies to adults as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And, and I just, I figured, I, I, I think those are, that's like one of the crises that we have in this country is we want to blame everybody for our problems. And um, if people would just take ownership, I think they'll feel better about themselves because then they can have, feel empowered to change. 
um, what they're doing. But um, sorry, we're going off on a no, little bit ownership that's, tangent. That's the but truth, I, though. I, I love it. It's, it's the good. truth. It's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I do want to talk just a little bit cold. So obviously you're talking to these kids. Um, they, when you're talking to them and you're telling them these things, like they probably look at you like you're a superhero, superhero, to be honest with you. Like, like their, their, their mentor and the person who is doing it is showing them how to do it. That that's so empowering for anyone. And, uh, I commend you for doing that. Definitely. Uh, what's the, just curious, what's the worst injury you've ever had on a bike? Um, I've been pretty fortunate to be honest. Um, the biggest thing is really though, I've hit my head quite a few times racing motorcycles, right? Um, just doing it since I was a young kid. Um, and maybe at a young kid, there was moments where I went, you know, over my head with, with how fast I was going or, or risking it a little too much. And then I put myself in not the best situations where it turned out, you know, on the, on the better, the worst side of the equation. So, um, just, just a couple of concussions along the way. I broke both collarbones. Um, I've done my, my thumb in a few times. I tore a bunch of ligaments on my ankle. Um, and then there's just little things here and there, but, um, you know, I just, I've been lucky, you know, there's a lot worse out there. A lot of guys with, you know, uh, ACLs and knees, you know, that'll give you issues along the long, long time and long term. And then, you know, other things, you know, big, big bones, femurs, stuff like that. That's, that's big stuff, right? Um, I've been fortunate and, uh, yeah, I count my blessings. That's awesome. Um, obviously we'll talk a little bit more about motorcycles here. I do want to get into real estate eventually, but I do think your story is very fascinating and it's a, it's a different approach than we're normally used to seeing. So I do, I do want to kind of, uh, take advantage of it while you're here. Absolutely. So, um, I was going to ask, so with that, when you're, when you're training and you're learning, What's one thing that you recommend somebody do when they're trying to get into something like that? Or what's something you recommend when they're trying to overcome an obstacle? All right. Well, I think with dirt bikes, you know, it's, there's a, there's a big factor in, in cost, right? So for, for families being able to afford a motorcycle, um, that's one thing. And then you get to buy the gas and then you have to buy all the equipment. And then you have to be able to afford, you know, the vehicle to transport it. Right. Um, and so there's a big, you know, issue for that in general, like getting a bicycle and just riding your bicycle around, around town is a lot, is a lot cheaper or picking up a basketball or whatever. So getting to the sport, first of all, is, is a big commitment. Um, and getting into dirt bike, motorcycle riding in general is a, is a fairly big commitment, um, on, on everyone's end. So, uh, know that at first, uh, secondly, um, if you want to get into to dirt bike racing and how you can kind of do it is, um, you know, starting as a family is the biggest thing. It's a great bonding tool for, for the whole family. Right. Um, I helped, I helped a, a family, a family in town here. Um, you know, they have, they have three boys, one girl, and they live on some property, a little acreage. And my wife became friends with them. And, um, you know, he asked me like, what, what I should, what kind of bikes I should get them. And, you know, I told him the bikes he should get. And he, he, they're fortunate that they have the income and the means to, to purchase those bikes and do it, but they also have 20 acres that they can, you know, these kids can go on and ride on. Right. And so giving them the bikes was, was just part of the thing. But the great thing is he's teaching these kids, you know, um, he's learning with them. He doesn't know how to work on motorcycles, but he's learning how to work on them. He also does not to ride them worth a darn either. So he's learning how to ride them just the same. Imagine that as a parent, you know, as a dad and you have your, your 12 year old and your, 10 year old and your eight year old boys or whatever. And they're, you know, they're kind of at that age where they're progressing and, um, they're learning and you're learning and you can kind of, you know, all kind of bond together in that, in that realm. Right. Um, there's the other side of the factor where you're like me and you're really, you know, well, well versed in motorcycle riding and you want to show your, your kids it. Right. So, um, you know, obviously I have the means to, to do that. Um, I have two girls, I wouldn't push it on them. They have little bikes and they can go ride around, but at the end of the day, you know, it's just for fun. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing is just making sure that the kids know that this is, this is fun. Be a, be a kid, you know, be a, be a kid, take it, give them their childhood, you know, let them, let them have that. It's precious time, right? Like we all know that when we grow up a little bit, life, life slaps us in the face, you know, and we got to start making real decisions and giving our kids the ability to, uh, to have that childhood and live in that mindset and be there for a long time, I think is a, is, is a good thing, you know? And so 
riding dirt bikes should be fun. That's how it should be. If you, if you want to take it further than that, um, you know, yeah, be prepared for the, for the costs on that end. But, uh, it's a good route. It's a good story. It's a good, uh, bonding. So all those things is, yeah, it can be, it can be rewarding. It can be very rewarding. And real quick, just on your family time too. So I know obviously you've got two daughters and a wife now. Has your time on the motorcycle decreased since having a family or are you still uh, pushing really hard for your career in enduro cross? Yeah. So it's just tougher for sure. You know, we, we know that the kids, you know, they, they're doing this or they're doing that and you want to give them, you know, take them to, to dance and gymnastics. So then we got ice skating and, you know, you want to entertain them and split your time and, um, still be relevant in, in the dirt biking thing. So like I said, in the beginning, when I was 21, dude, there's nothing else going on. That's it. You know, I'm spending my time on the motorcycle and it's all about me, right? You know, you can be completely all in, all selfish. Um, and then once you get a little bit older and you decide that, all right, well, I want to have a family and, you know, I want to give these kids the most that I possibly can. Um, a lot more things start crossing your mind too, right? So risk, injury, um, all those things are possible, but when you're 21, you don't, well, whatever. It's just you, you know? Like, oh yeah, you're invincible. You can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want and you don't have to think about anybody else either, right? You don't have to think about like how this affects their life, you know? So with me and my occupation, there is inherent risks. And at the end of the day, um, I just have to be more calculated and that's where I get into the quality over quantity. So when I, when I put my time in on the motorcycle, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going out specifically to, uh, to get the job done, to do what I need to do, to be fit, um, to get the practice and the training in that I need. Um, uh, and then when I'm done with that, I move on to what I need to do to be there for, for the family, you know, get the stuff done for the family. So whether that's cleaning up or making dinner or entertaining the kids or, um, trying to, trying to learn and grow with them and, uh, teach them stuff and, whatever that is, you know, I'm just here for it. And so trying to split your time between those two is, is definitely key. And that's, uh, it's always changing too. Cause the kids, you know, at one point they're just in diapers and they don't really communicate. And now, you know, my almost five-year-old, right. So she's communicating and, uh, requires a little bit more, uh, of a different kind of attention than she did a couple of years ago. So, it's a it's a fun process, right? We're all we're all in it together. We're all in it, right? The three of us. So we all know. Yeah, we're all dads. <laughs> I, I remember, <laughs> but I can totally relate with you, man. When I was twenty one, I, I did not care what happened to my body. In my mind, I didn't think about consequences as much as I do these days. And I remember when I've had my daughter a few years ago, uh, something just like basic instincts took over, um, and it wasn't something I had to put much thought into. It's just something like. Oh, all of a sudden I got this baby. I got to make sure lives <laughs> and I got to be there in full function to make sure that she gets food. And it's just interesting how the, you're, you mature, like you like mature immediately, automatically. <laughs> Most people. You live for exterior motives basically, right? So like we were living for ourselves when we were younger. Now it's like we, we live for our why and our why is our family now. And, and that's adapted and changed, but we can still do what we love. And that's great. So, yeah. but the real estate investing and all this other part of it, you know, it's like, uh, there's definitely a lot less, uh, uh, physical, physical risk for the most part, unless you're, unless you're trying to get up there and do some, do some, uh, whatever roofing or some unless you're on a scaffolding or whatever, there's still risk. <laughs> and you don't know what you're doing, you know, but yeah, uh, essentially on this, on this side of it, um, why we've, we've essentially became to know each other is, uh, definitely a lot less risk and, uh, it's, uh, but the challenge is there. So it's interesting for that regard. I do want to go back to your, uh, your personal household, obviously. So you bought it pretty early on in 2012, you said, um, obviously now it's worth a lot more than it ha was worth when you bought it. Have you done anything with that equity or have you just left it in the house? Like what have you done that has been, uh, growing your portfolio a little bit? Yeah. So when I had bought that place in 2012, um, so I was 20, I was 21. Um, and so I, uh, like I said, I bought it just so I could focus on my career and put myself in a position to, uh, to win races and championships. And that was the whole goal. So Really what happened was, um, as you can imagine, there's a, there's a life expectancy and a, and a window of opportunity with racing a motorcycle, you know, um, there's a, there's a small window of opportunity to win, 
um, and there's a short amount of life expectancy that you have in that career. So let's say let's say I've been doing this for 15 years. That's a pretty pretty healthy motorcycle career, you know. Um, especially for something that just to get to professional level, you put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of focus, um, blood, sweat, tears, and and dollars into to just to get to the professional level. Not alone, you know. Once you got there, then you had another 15 years of of essentially making money doing it. Um, so I got to this point in the house where uh, 2019, my daughter is one years old, and uh, we already went over what where you start your brain starts going when you have this kid that relies on you and a wife that also, in in a lot of ways, depends on you. You know, if I go away, whatever. My wife is well equipped. She's smart. She's bright. She's pure. Bu- Brilliant, she's beautiful, she'll she'll be fine. But at the end of the day, you want to do your best to be there for everybody and supply everybody with what you can to uh to be as successful as possible. So 2019, daughter's one years old, and uh I'm thinking, you know, where do I want to raise my kid? Where do I raise my 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 child? Um I visited Court of Lane in 2000 and uh 2011. I had at this point, not traveled the world, but I've ridden in a lot of places in the continental U.S. for the most part, and always kind of had an idea of where are these where are these places that I what what are these places I like, right? And I had come to Coeur d'Alene, and I met some cool people, and we went on the lake, and we went wakeboarding or wake surfing, we went mountain biking, uh, we went and had some awesome food and breakfast and lunch, and uh, raced dirt bikes, and then went downtown and. It's August 1st weekend. I'm 21. Like it's a pretty cool spot to be August 1st weekend. Like it's not, it's not too, it's not too shabby. Right. So i I find myself like really like attracted to this area and just kind of remember like the good time I had. Um, and so I kind of kept that as a benchmark as I spent the next 10 years, you know, racing, well, seven, 2019, I spent the next seven years racing the world and uh, kept Coeur d'Alene as a benchmark. And so in the end, I didn't find a place that was cooler. So I was like, I'm, my daughter's one years old. I want to raise her in a cool community, a good place. I feel like that's hearty and wholesome and, you know, good, good people. And so, yeah, that's when we decided to move. And I sold um, that house in California. And the reason for selling it was also because of that window of opportunity. Um, you know, I felt like I could move a lot of that equity, right. That I had built up into it, um, into more real estate. Um, potentially I went down the rabbit hole with some rich dad, poor dad and saw the, obviously I already saw the benefits of my property, uh, going up in value, but then I, also read about all the benefits of properties, uh, rental properties, right? So, and all the benefits you can get with that. So I need to start thinking about what I was going to do um, to to provide for the family if I stopped racing tomorrow it was a big thing. So um, that's when I was like, well, I'm going to take that that money that I have built up and start kind of allocating it towards rental properties and in the quarter lane area, because that's where I think I want to be for a long term. And that's kind of, that's what I did with the equity in the, in the, in the long, the long form version of it. That's awesome. You know, what's so funny is, um, so Jeremy and I, we went on a road trip when we were 21, right? right? 20, maybe, maybe we were 20. 20, I think, but yeah, I think we pretended to be 21 <laughs> we while did. we were on that trip. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, this was about 2007 or so, and uh, I remember us. Uh, Jeremy, do you remember driving around the entire country? And then when we came back home to Coeur d'Alene, do you remember how beautiful that drive was coming into Coeur d'Alene? And yeah. it's like you know we were raised there. We had no idea what what a beautiful area we lived in until we traveled the entire country and we were driving back into Coeur d'Alene. We're just like, damn, this is nice. <laughs> It was the most beautiful watching you get you get put in handcuffs too, but that's a cool oh, yeah. story for another day. So. <laughs> yeah, man, you're not you're not wrong. So, uh, people that uh, that grew up here probably don't take a lot of people might be taking it for granted, right? 
but if you never yeah, leave, they just don't know yeah if you never leave you just you just don't know right at the end of the day so um like i said traveled all over the world left uh left this place as a benchmark for what i saw and what i wanted to compare it to and didn't find another plot, spot that i thought was any any better or cooler and so here i am so what is your uh what does your portfolio look like now if you don't mind sharing yeah no worries we have five properties um, basically single families, a couple duplexes, uh, a couple Airbnbs and, uh, long terms. And, um, yeah, so we're doing that. And, uh, my goal was, so, uh, <laughs> the goal was like the medium, the medium house, single family house at the time when I came here in 2019 full time and I was going to move that money was like 300, 300,000 probably for, you know, a median, median house, right? Like solid three bed, two bath, clean house. I was like, all right, well, I could buy buy six, you know, maybe seven if I stretch it type thing with the money that I have type type deal. And, um, you know, I know I can get these rents. Yeah, pretty, pretty safe deal, right? Well, here comes COVID three <laughs> months later. And then you start going, oh, well, I don't know if I want to buy anything right now because, you know, the world's going to end. And then like, Three, four, five months later, you're like, uh oh, like inflation's rampant and prices are going through the roof, and my whole plan is going thrown out the window. So it's funny because, like, here we are back to the original like story with the dirt bike, right? Like, like you you have this plan, you have this this thought of how it's going to go, you know, and you think the trajectory is like just climbing steady and going upward always, right? Nah, nah, nah. It's like I crashed on that rock and I, you know, broke my collarbone in Spain, right? Oh, well, I'll tell you a good story about it. I was in Spain, 17 years old, and uh, and went over the bars and practiced, knocked myself out, woke up in a, hosp- uh, in a bed strapped up on a headboard deal, strapped up in a dark room with people speaking this foreign language above me. Didn't remember where I was, anything. I was scared of my mind. That's one of those things, right? Like here I am showing promise and talent and skill. I think I know what I'm doing. I crash, I get knocked down. I have this weird kind of experience in Spain. I don't give up, right? It's just something that happens. All right, same thing with real estate, right? I yeah. come here with a plan. I think it's going to go this way. Everything changes. So I so I adapt. So that's kind of Speaking of plans, I mean Mike Tyson has like the best quote yeah. out there. It's like everyone has a plan until until you get punched in the face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> We just got to weave and keep punching, you know? Yeah. And if we're not adapting, we're not changing. And if we're not changing, we're not growing at the same time. So it's like the ability to adapt to is is really good. Obviously, especially in a changing market like we've all had, um, we've all had to kind of make adjustments on how we want to run our business and how we want to grow our investments. So props to you for uh, getting that all done. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's by no means, and, and it's just, you know, scratching the surface of it all. Right. So I've, I, I literally started with, you know, that rich dad, poor dad. And like I said, that, that house that I used as, as my racing career. And then, uh, yeah, so we have a couple of properties and I'm, I'm deep into every facet, you know, I have some, uh, I have some midterm rentals. Um, I have some long terms and I have some short terms and I'm just deep in the weeds learning every little nook and cranny that I possibly can, just like I did with the dirt bike thing. You know, I'm uh, just completely getting to that point of obsession uh, all over again. Of the three rental strategies that you're currently doing, you know, long-term Airbnb, mid-term, mid-term rentals so far, what, what's, what's been your favorite and what's working best for you? I really like Airbnb. I really like short-term. I like providing a unique space. I like providing a space that people enjoy to come to that they're excited about um that they had a great time with i like providing it i like having the customer service that they sit down and they say man like we just had an awesome time and you guys made it great you were there to answer our questions or needed anything or if you wanted a spot to go eat you know you knew the spot to go um just good communication being there for people knowing what uh, amenities are out there and uh and providing a Ultimately, a, a great a great vacation in an amazing place. You know, uh, love obviously Coeur d'Alene, Love the area. Love all the p- things you can do. And I'm just trying to do my best to uh, to to share that with uh, people that come here. So 
And and that makes sense coming from you knowing that you know you run a property management company as well, so you're not you're not afraid of dealing with people on a regular basis. Yeah, right? no, I, I I'm enjoying it. Yeah, the uh, the communication thing is is key uh, with everybody and setting ex- expectations. So uh, I think that's a big thing with Airbnb too, right? So it's obviously you don't want to put something out there that's that's a false advertising in any way right so like let's say for example you have a you have a house and then the house you know you have a photo looking out at a window and then you just decided to uh photoshop the lake in that window that would be that would be pretty misleading right yep <laughs> so i think at the end of the day setting expectations and that they know what they're getting to they feel like they're getting a value for what their price is and what they're where they're staying and all that and at the end of the day, it, it, it creates a, a good uh, a good stay and happy uh, vacationers. So I love it. That's good stuff. And Nick, by the way, when you interrupted me, I was going to ask the exact same question. So you didn't even interrupt. We just uh, flowed with what we got. That was good. Our minds are in sync. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I know Airbnb is your favorite strategy, Colton. Uh, what is your What is your most profitable strategy? Um. <laughs> yeah. So that all depends on if uh, where your Airbnb is. Let's say or your midterm rental or your long-term, right? Or Sure. Yeah. So, and if we're talking about profitability, are we talking about return on, you know, cash? Are we talking about return on equity? Are we talking about, yeah. So there's a lot of different things, right? And how much, how much time did you want to put into each of those, right? So obviously I like to tier it pretty simply. Like Airbnb is probably going to be, um, your cost of entry is probably going to be the highest, um, your amount of time, effort, work uh, is going to be the highest. Your payoff for that time, work, and effort can be the highest. Scale down from there, you know, midterm rental, three months, 30 days, 30 days or more, depends on what it is, right? Um, Technically, a lot of times they're 90 days. Um, You still have like kind of all the costs that you do with, uh, with, Airbnb, you know, you get to furnish it. Um, you have a lot of the amenities that you do with Airbnb. Maybe you don't invest in a hot tub, um, stuff like that. Maybe you don't go the extra over the top with things, but you still have, you know, 10, 20, you know, grand of furnishings potentially, depending on how big your space is. With a midterm rental, are you paying um, for like the Wi Fi and the power bill and all that? Utilities, as well? the whole thing. Yep. Okay. Yep, you're paying for the whole thing. So, um, but you get most likely uh, very professional, clean. Um, they're here for a contract. They're here for a reason. Um, a lot of times, their money comes from uh, their employer or um, maybe insurance, depending on if uh, they had a disaster in their own home or you know if a tree fell in their house or there was a fire or a flood, whatever. You know, things happen. That's, that's life. But, you know, that money's coming from insurance companies, for example, on those midterms. Um, or maybe someone's building a house. A lot of people are, you know, waiting for their houses to be built, you know. Um, and so they, they need a place to be for a while and they, want all the, they don't want to move all their stuff and then move it again and move it again. So they're looking for, for that. So what that provides you, like I said, uh, most likely a professional, clean and, uh, you know, good tenant, good person, you know, and, and that's going to take care of things and be respectful. Um, so less work, um, you basically talk to them in the beginning, kind of provide a little bit of, uh, um, information and talk to them and just get them kind of settled in to the place, um, stay in contact if they need anything. And then from there, you know, you kind of, it's a little bit more long-term tenant at that point, right? Where it's a bit of a set and forget type of situation. Now you have to deal with it again, probably 90 days later. Um, you know, 90 days later, you're, you're trying to refill it and remarket it and do all those things. So um, about, uh, let's say, let's say if that was quarterly, let's say it's four times more, more work than, uh, than a long-term tenant, let's say, right? And Airbnb is 10 to 20 times more work depending on what you got going on. So long-term tenant on the last thing, you know, and a, a long-term stay, right. It's a, uh, it's a bit more of a set it and forget it type of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, 
providing a, uh, a space that they're happy with, um, that they feel like they're getting a good value for, they're not getting um, ripped off and they feel like they're being, you know, that, that, that their, their voice is heard and that they're being cared for at the end of the day is, is, is key, right? So um, that's kind of what we focus on. Um, really just truly, I believe that we focus on people and, and providing value and customer service and good communication, um, picking up the phone, being available, so these are all lines for, for Lake CDA property management, by the way, we didn't really get into it, but yeah. Yeah. So I was gonna say, I do want to talk about your, uh, your property management business since we're on the subject. Actually. Yeah, no so, worries. Um... <laughs> yeah. Kind of, kind of ranted there for a bit, but yeah, no, essentially, that's okay. like I said, the, uh, Airbnb is the most profitable, most work midterm Makes is sense. exactly what it says. It's mid, it's mid between long and short. And then long term mm-hmm. is your safest kind of long, long haul bet. And I was going to say, the thing about that that's so cool is because obviously the more that you have your Airbnbs, your midterm rentals, everything like that, the more systems you're going to need in place. And the more systems you need in place, enter your property management company, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's all good. Why don't you uh, tell us about that a little bit, if you don't mind, please? Yeah, so really the property management came up um, through just kind of having our own um, properties. So managing our own stuff. A good background story would be 2012 ish. A lot of things started in that year for me. I don't know. I bought my first house. Uh, my wife and I started kind of, uh, well, we started dating 2010, but I just, for whatever reason, life, life started happening more in 2012, right? So, um, <clears throat> wife and I are dating. She had a condo in California. She, Um, she was kind of going through a transition with work and whatnot, and we were getting pretty serious. And, um, I wanted to basically be with her more, but I said, Hey, why don't you, why don't you move in with, with me? Um, I was just renting a room from, from somebody in, uh, previous 2012. So she's living, she's living with me and she said, we're going to rent out her condo. Um, so she rents it out to these, uh, family of four. And, uh, seemed like really nice people seemed, 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 seemed cool, seemed down to earth, seemed good. Like this will be fine. Um, a couple months go by, you know, we get the story. They don't want to pay. They're losing their job. Cancer dog died. I don't know. Everything and anything under the sun that they can do to not basically pay at this point. Right. Well, this is, this is young Colton. This is young Hannah. So, um, we don't know how to handle this, but we're going to figure it out. Well, we're in California. We figure out that we can't actually take um, six months worth of rent at all. Can't take a dime while they live in the house for free while until we can get them out, right? So they have a lot of rights as, mm-hmm. as tenants and as renters in California, Oregon, Washington, these places. So um, they, those are laws favor um, favor tenants in a lot of ways in those situations. So six months go by. Um, we finally get to court. They, uh, they trashed the place. They completely wrecked the whole inside of the condo. Um, we had to pay all the court fees. They just walk away scot-free basically. And they just go on to the next person to, uh, to, to do that to the next person. They're professionals. They knew exactly what they're doing. We're young, we're inexperienced and, and, uh, and they knew it. They took advantage of us. So most people, you know, 20 grand later, trying to fix this place up, get it back to where, where it was when we first started renting to them. Most people probably would have turned their back on, for sure, property management or called somebody that knew what they're doing, um, at the very least. Maybe turn their back on real estate in general. I don't know. That wasn't my wife and that wasn't uh, me. So instead, we came up with a, a bunch of systems in place, came up with a much better lease agreement, uh, fixed the place up, um, had a lot more systems in place to, to vet tenants, uh, run credit, run backgrounds, do the whole deal. So this is 10, 10 plus years ago, you know, we already had to do it for ourselves and go through the hardship of learning the hard way to, uh, to get to where we put a new tenant in and, uh, and ran into him for another year and a half. And he was awesome. He did a great job, was really respectful and, uh, and everything worked out really well with that tenant until he wanted to move out. And, uh, my wife decided she wanted to sell the place. So 
that was that on that condo. But, uh, but that taught us a lot of, you know, valuable lessons that we learned on our own in the very beginning. Um, things that we definitely make sure never happened to anyone that we manage the property for today. Um, and we never want to see happen to, to anybody and, uh, uh, in, in the future. So, um, it kind of sounds like the uh, story of the rock, if I can interfere yeah, just go a little for it. bit. <laughs> you know, like the the rock was always there, just like those tenants, you know. Yeah. They're, they're just going to do what they're going to do. But you, you know, instead of blaming, you just uh, you just were aware, oh, you need more systems and processes in place. Yep. Because the tenants are just like that rock. They're just on the path. You're right. That And you just got to, you just got to know now. That the rock's not going to uh, adjust to your needs always. You keep saying the rock, by the way. And I, I know. Keep thinking w- Dwayne w- Johnson in my yeah. head. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, what? What lesson has he given you here? This yeah. is great. I let's, <laughs> let's let's full circle the rock on the trail for the dirt bike race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young yeah, kid. sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> for those for those just tuning in, <laughs> that's so funny. We're talking about a a phys- Yeah, never mind. Go ahead. Yeah. So essentially in the end, uh, you know, it's exactly that it's a, it's a rock on the trail that in the end, the tenants were the rock. They, they were just there. Um, you put them in there and in the end you, you could blame the rock for you crashing that didn't move, or you can blame yourself for staring at the rock and you running into it. Uh, just like the same as not having the systems in place to, uh, to manage the property, um, and the tenants in the, in, in the proper fashion. Right. So Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that, Nick. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the way it is, and that's exactly the way I approach approach uh, life. So, it's a good way to approach it for sure. Um, I think a good way to learn is exactly by what you did, actually. So, I mean, you know, a, a lot of people can read a book and they won't take anything in from the book, but life can happen to them, and they can fight or flight at that point. So, when life happens to you in your rentals, you're like, oh, we need better things to take care of these. And that's exactly what you did. So uh, props to you on building up that business as well. That's super cool. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we, uh, so like I said, we moved, we moved here and I actually bought, I actually bought here before I moved here full time. So I bought in 2016, I bought a house to have up here during the summer and spring. Cause I thought, I thought it'd be cool to, uh, to come up and ride dirt bikes and get out of the heat of Southern California. Um, this is in the middle of my, my racing career. I'm really, I'm, I'm winning a lot and I'm, I'm deep in it, you know, and wanting to, uh, to keep kind of progressing with the racing and all that. So yeah, we bought a house, uh, here in 2016 and that was another thing. We, we, we started renting it. So we rented to the same, same people for, for three years. And, uh, and then when we decided to, to move here, I wasn't going to move those tenants out. They're awesome. They're doing a great job. I love them. They're, they're taking care of the place and I'm not going to remove them from home just because I was moving here. So I bought another place and, uh, and so what I do, instead of just buying another place and just getting a single family home, nah, I took it on a strategy. I, I started house hacking. That was the first thing I did as I, uh, I decided to implement a, a, another, you know, form of real estate strategy into my portfolio, if you'd say, or my arsenal, you know, mm-hmm. uh, kind of going down the rabbit hole of, okay, how does, how does this work exactly? So I ended up splitting a house. Uh, it was a four bed, two bath. It was identical up uh, on, the, on the main floor and in the basement. And nice. uh, I basically had a separate entrance to the garage. So I walled off the middle of the garage. Uh, I put a kitchen in downstairs, uh, laundry room and, and yeah. And so furnished it and then started renting it to, uh, the midterm, the midterm rentals. So while well, I lived upstairs for free. So that's awesome. That's some pretty good house hacking. So that was a split entry type house. It wasn't, it was a, it was a full uh, main, main level, two bed, one bath. And then downstairs in the basement is a two bed, one bath. So I walled off the stairwell inside the house. And then I walled off the middle of the garage. So they had the left side garage, two doors, two single doors. So they had left side garage. They go downstairs into the basement. I'm on the right side. I go into the main level upstairs. Um, yeah. And so we lived there for, um, pretty much two years. Um, kind of like that until our second, second child was born. And then, uh, she started coming, she came out of the womb screaming. So we said, oh, well, maybe we should consider not house hacking. Cause I don't think anyone's going to want to live with us for a little bit. Can you go back just a little bit? So I don't think we ever really kind of t- touched on how, how were you able to find these deals? Um, and, um, did, did you just buy what was on the MLS or did you go a different strategy? Yeah, just MLS, you know, um, 
So my uh, good friend here in, in town uh, was Josh Adams. Mm-hmm. Yep. Keller Williams agent and does a lot of, does a lot of business, meets a lot of people. And uh, so he's a dirt bike rider, you know? And so that was one of the people that I met originally um, that first trip to Coeur d'Alene. You know, I think we, I think I slept on the floor in his basement or something. And while I stayed here that August 1st weekend, having a great time, went to bed at three in the morning. Wasn't much sleep actually, I should say, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we just became friends from, from that point, you know, we had a common interest in dirt bikes and mountain biking and all that. So, um, yeah, I know he's a huge mountain biker. Yeah. And we, we stayed in contact. He'd come down to California, um, and stay with me for a few weeks during the winter. He, he drive his, his, one of his vehicles down his van down, leave it at my, my house in Southern California. And then he'd fly in, get out of the snow for two weeks, ride dirt bikes, sell some houses from far. I mean, oh, so many times on the trail, he would just be on his phone and I'm trying to ride and train. I'm like, dude, like, come on, man, we're riding. Like, I don't want to wait for you anymore. Oh, I just got to get this this deal together. You know, I'm just right you know, the whatever, you know. So anyways, great, great dude. So he helped me um, for sure by um, those those first, well, all the houses that I have, he helped me, he helped me buy um, until now my wife is a, is a real estate agent with Keller Williams and and since the rabbit hole has continued, you know, I've gotten my, my license as well. I went through the whole schooling, just haven't hung it, just haven't hung it anywhere. Uh, I, uh, I'm still racing dirt bikes. I'm still super busy. Uh, I wasn't really knowing if I was willing and ready to, uh, to, to go the distance. I'm a, I'm a kind of guy, like I'm either going hundred percent in or I'm out. So unless I'm hundred percent in, which I am on the, the property management and the, uh, and the dirt bike racing for now. Um, when that day comes, when the dirt biking probably stops for the most part, then I'll probably go hundred percent all in agent and uh, property manager. Good thing is your wife's already an agent too. So one way or another, you guys are collecting those agent commissions and that helps offset any sort of costs in getting into the property too. So that's, that's always a good thing. Yeah. We haven't actually bought anything for ourselves yet using it. Um, but it's really cool. Um, you know, she, she has the ability to obviously use the MLS um, and then be connected to other people in the, in the industry so that deals and things come, come across our table and then, uh, as an investor, right? So you're looking at as an investor, if you wanted to st- keep adding to your portfolio and getting some more cash flow. And then on the property management thing is really cool too, because, you know, we have the ability to help, um, a lot of people who are renting right now, but they, they want a home, right? So, you know, we can, we can talk to them and, and, and be, uh, be a facilitator for them and finding a place to, to live. Um, and then a lot of times, you know, people, investors and whatnot, you know, they, uh, they sometimes want to, you know, sell their house or whatever. And we can kind of be, be in, in, in the know and, and help and help either help either them sell it or, or offer, uh, advice and how to go about it, or maybe we'd be willing to buy it or whatever, you know? So just, just being in the, being in the industry and just kind of being willing to, to do whatever and be, be there for people, I think is a, is a big proponent for it. It opens up a lot of avenues for sure for you. And I like how you come at it from the point of helping people, because that's what real estate is, right? We're all trying to help one another. We're all trying to help somebody either get out of a bad situation or help get them into a better situation. Yeah. So for right now, um, the dirt bike racing, I take, uh, truly day by day. Um, I'm so contracted for the rest of this year with rockstar energy factory Husqvarna racing team. So I have about 20 and so weekends a year that I race. Um, I really want to get another, uh, enduro cross championship. I'm, I'm, I need one more championship to have the most all time. So that's, that's a big goal of mine. Um, I'd like to accomplish that this year. Um, Outside of that, uh, the property management thing I'm, I'm all in on. Um, I really, really, truly do enjoy it. Um, I like, <laughs> I had to go to court uh, on Monday for an eviction. And that wasn't like the most fun of anything. But then I was in the court, I was in the courtroom and I was like, the lingo and all the laws and the way it goes down. And it's just, I don't, I just take a, a natural interest into things. So 
You're gonna become a lawyer now too. Oh, I did. I don't know. I really it crossed my mind, and I was like, eh. yeah, "This is pretty cool too." Yeah, yeah. Eight years down the road, man. I don't know. You're excelling at any everything you touch. This is great. So just yeah, pick up law as well. See what happens. Yeah. So the product management thing, we're all in. Um, we're picking up properties all the time. Uh, short 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 term goal for that is is to have a uh, hundred properties under management uh, by the mid mid this year. So we're about ish half ish of that right now. Um, so the reason for that being is, um, you know, I don't know how long the dirt bike thing is really going to, to last, uh, much. I've, I've, I've done a lot. I've won a lot. I've gone a lot of places. I've done a lot, but my, uh, my appetite for, for real estate, my appetite and my new challenges is, is really growing, you know, inside. And I can tell when something is really speaking to me, like the dirt bike did. Um, you know, so my passion for dirt bike racing and, and trying to be as, man, as good as I possibly can at, at riding that motorcycle takes me down every, every avenue from, you know, how I eat, how I think, how I sleep, um, you know, how I, how I position myself on the bike, how I train, how I, all of it. Right. And so I find myself, um, doing the same thing with, with real estate is just kind of going down that same, that same, um, mental state where, I'm taking it in on all, on all accounts. Um, so the property management thing for sure is a big one. I don't know how long the dirt bike thing is going to last. And so if I can get to a hundred units, um, that's, that's a good, uh, uh, amount of, of things to take on while we're, I'm still racing full time. Um, and, and the challenge of, of building a business, you know, um, is, is really interesting to me. Right. So yeah, I don't, Go for it. Colton, I've got I've got a question, um, but I'm sure a lot of people are curious. Is it worth going down that route income wise if they did that for a living? All right. Well, let's put it this way. If you were to have all the free time in the world, right? I don't have to be anywhere or here to anybody. I have to be at 20 dirt bike races a year. But if you like riding dirt bikes and you like racing, not really a bad problem, right? So I have all the free time in the world. Um, I get to ride the best motorcycles in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get all this stuff for free. I get people who, you know, clamor to hang out or get autographs from. You know, I'm a, I'm in, I'm in the limelight of of it. You know, there's a lot of good feel from all that, right? You're recognized, you're seen, and there's all that. So those are all things to also consider when uh, when you're doing something. You know, um, I think I think being a, a real estate uh, investor or agent is a, is very, is very cool, challenging, rewarding. Um, it doesn't have the same impactful moments necessarily as a, as a 15,000 people screaming stadium after you just passed for the world championship on the last turn or the last lap against a rival. That's how I won my first world championship in Spain. Well, you've never you've never closed any short sales then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you call you let me know when fifteen thousand people start yelling for it. You know, so yeah, I'm just energy, I'm joking. No, for continue. sure. Continue <laughs> the energy. The energy is something that you get addicted to, right? So um, there's all those things. So that's pretty hard to let go of. It's hard to let go of, yeah, because it's a good amount of money, especially for something that you like doing, uh, and then all those other things that I mentioned, right? So. And I know, you know, a property manager, there, there's a lot of work involved there and you have to, and you have to manage a lot of properties to kind of duplicate that same type of income, right? No, it's, it's a lot. And, uh, but like I said, I think the, the, the key is so racing, racing dirt bikes it, for me, the end results is not really the thing that I, I, you, you, you're going for the end result the whole time, but it's the journey that was everything, you know? It was everything. It was like how 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 I got there was the part that I that I love the most, you know. And so I can remember that now for, you know, building building a property management business, you know, or a real estate being a real estate agent and building a business for for that too, you know. I think it's it's the journey along the way that I'm gonna that I'm gonna really truly enjoy the most. Um, yes, there's that end goal, but. Um, that keeps me, that keeps me super, super grounded and, uh, and centered in, in life, knowing that not every day is going to be the best day. There's going to be ups and downs, but at the end, but at the end of it, I'm really going to look truly, I, I think I'm going to look back and I'm going to say, 
I did way more than I ever thought I was, you know, because that's how the dirt bike thing was. I was just like, I just want to be professional. And then I was a professional. And then I was like, well, I just want to win a race. And then I want to race. And I was like, well, I just want to win a championship. And then I won a championship. And then I was like, okay, I won 10. That's 10 times what I ever thought I was. I mean, that's 10 times what I thought I was going to do at that point. That's a hundred times what I thought I was going to do when I was a kid. So think about the same thing. If you had a, it, it's a, it's a new, it's a new lease on life. You know, you're starting a, a second career, you know, with property, the property management or real estate in general. So I feel like a kid again with it. Um, and so I don't know what the ceiling is. And one of the biggest things for me is see, I hate ceilings. Oh, I hate ceilings. If you, if you sat me down on a, in a nine to five job and, uh, you know, like they're like, you're only going to make this much and you have nowhere to go in, in the career or the job. Shoot me now. I mean, can't do it. I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm going to figure out, I'm going to figure out any other way than that, you know? On the, on the same way. That's what makes you guys great. Yeah. Anytime I've ever had a job, I always knew this is temporary. I'm just going to learn from this and move on because uh, I feel the same way. Yeah. If you're, if you know what your limits are and you're within an organization and you're like, okay, you can see the end result. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you want? No, I want more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, Nick, any final thoughts before we kind of get into the uh, wind down section? I know we're uh, we're passing an hour here, which is a okay. This has been an awesome conversation with Colton. I've really enjoyed it a lot. So, yeah, no, we appreciate what you're doing, man. Um, I know, I know, we're getting just past the hour mark. So why don't we get to the final questions and we'll let Colton go back to work? Yeah, man, absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for being here, Colton. We definitely appreciate you taking the time to hang out with Nick and I and uh, talk about all your successes and your failures and how you've been uh, overcoming them all. Um, I do have some final questions here that we're just going to be winding down with, if that's okay. Uh, the first one is, if you have a business or investing book you recommend every single person read, what book is that? Honestly, I just got to go to the classic Rich Dad, Poor Dad for me. You know, just it just really just opens up your mind to what what the possibilities are. Um, um, yeah, it's a great book. Uh, it's helped probably millions of people, let's be honest, you know, so... It's uh, definitely a life-changing book for sure. Um, so if you had $30 million gifted to one of your bank accounts, Colton, what's the first thing you would spend it on? So I gave a lot of thought to this question because um, because uh, you sent me a couple of questions before in, 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 in previous to this conversation. So um, I like to think that I would take that money and create and make, make it $100 million or $300 million. Right. That's what we all think. Like, oh, if I just had 30 million, I could I could do what Elon Musk does. Right. I could I could be a billionaire, you know, like but I just can't get ten dollars together. You know, that's the problem. Right. So um, and then I help I help people with I help people with not a, a ton of money, you know, as some people are tenants and renters that I help. And then I help a lot of people with a lot of money. And uh and they have multiple properties, right? Multiple properties with us and they buy them all cash and it's not even a question, right? So I look at them and I go, what are, what are they doing that a person like me that's trying to get to where they're going or what get to where they're at, what am I doing differently than they are? What they do is they are not trying to lose money. Getting money, making money, they can do. Keeping it, saving it, holding on to it is the hard one, right? How much money do we need, really? I mean, if you have 30 million bucks, mm -hmm. I mean, you could put, what? You could put 30 million into a CD and make six, seven, eight percent, I don't know, a year off of that. Be a good amount of money. I mean, I'm almost 300 grand, right? Yeah, something like that. Like, yeah, two, 200, 220, something like that. Just, I'm not good with the math, but yeah, it sounds about right. That's livable. It's a pretty safe bet, right? So I guess what I'm getting at is I don't, I don't need, I don't need a lot, you know, as a, as a person, and as a human, I want to, I want, I enjoy my time. I like, I want to be able to do things with my family. Um, I want to be able to do those things in a, in a provide in a safe, secure way. And I want us to be able to, 
to love and live life in the best capacity. Um, so if you had 30 million bucks, I think, uh, you know, I'd invested in, in, you know, safe, you know, real estate personally, um, things that are, you know, deferred maintenance on, you know, so new, new construction, new builds, things that I know that I can rent, I can get solid people in, um, that I can rent to them for a super fair price that they feel appreciated to be there. Um, which is a totally different, you know, route than essentially I'm going at the moment in a way, you know, I mean, I did a house hack, I have Airbnbs, um, I'm putting a lot of time, you know, effort, um, and a little more risk into, into my investments, but I'm also, um, I'm not sitting on 30 million. So, um, that's the difference. So at the end of the day, that's probably what I would do. Awesome. I love that. I love that question too. It seems to be a, a really thought provoking question that I ask people because a lot of people, sometimes people will buy a boat. Sometimes people will throw it all in apartments. It's just curious. Like what would you do if you had it? Like, you know, it's cool. So, yeah, I think, I think the other day, like, like you said, the apartment thing, right. That's what I kind of get to with the safe, you know, kind of deal. Right. Um, yeah. Diversify and overcome. I love it. Uh, what advice would you give to newer investors looking to get started on their either first or second deal? Okay. Well, I got to give a shout out to my, my buddy, Craig Curlop, uh, the Fi the Fi guy, I think it is. Um, you know, I don't even know if I learned exactly from him, the house hack thing, but I definitely listened to it for the first time on bigger pockets and, uh, it could have been Craig, but at the end of the day, I think that the house hack thing for a first time buyer, 23 year old kid, um, it's like, it's a life changing move. You know, I think you can give away a little bit of your, um, um, comforts in the first five years, uh, of investing in a property or two properties or three properties, whatever it is. If you gave up a little bit of those comforts, you know, renting out the two other rooms or three other rooms so that your payment was only 500 bucks, you know, or, or free or whatever. Um, that goes a long way because, uh, because, you know, the cost of living is, is high. Um, and if you have the means and the ability to do so with, uh, with a house hack, man, I think that's a, that's a really, really, really great way to get started, uh, safe in the regard of like, you know, you're, um, mitigating a lot of the risk that you take on with, with all that debt and the mortgage and, um, all that. So that's a, that's a really safe, solid move when buying your first property, um, that you get to live in and, that's what I suggest. That's awesome. Yeah. House hacking is definitely a very, very good way to get started if you're interested in real estate investing. Uh, a couple more questions here for you, Colton. How would you define success? Um, you know, I think success comes down to expectation. Um, and expectation is brought upon by your, uh, your, your desires and what's, what's burning kind of inside you, you know? So if you have a, burning desire to do something and you expect to achieve that, um, then I think it's easy to look at, I achieved that or I didn't as a, as a pass or fail in, in the world, in the, in the line of success. Um, but ultimately, you know, that can, I think at the end of the day, if you can look at yourself in the mirror and, uh, and you can say, I did everything I could, you know, and I'm, trying to be the best person I can be. What more, what more, what more is there? What more do you need? You know, like I think the highest regard of success is I think you can look at yourself and say, you know, I, I did, I did the right thing. You know, I did all that I could and I did it the, to the best ability that I possibly could. Um, and that's, that's, that's all we have. Everybody's level of what that even is, is different too. Yeah. I really like what you said, like right away, like success is like expectations. Like you, you had this expectation instead of hope. And, um, I remember like the first time I ever listened to like a Tony Robbins full program, that was one of the biggest things that stuck out to me right away. They just did this exercise where, you know, I want you to really hope for something to work out and then you change and then, you know, you'd go through this practice for 30 seconds to a minute and then it's like, okay, take that same thing. And I want you to just change the language a little bit and just expect that this will happen. You know, have, have expectations about it. 
And uh, it's, all it is is just changing up the word. You know, you're changing your language. You're taking it, you're taking responsibility for it, right? You're yeah. hoping, yeah. you're hoping is just a, oh, maybe this will happen because of things will just fall into place and that could work. But when you start expecting it, you start thinking about it, you reconstructing it from, from the ground up, right? So you're going, here's, here's where I want to be. Now, how the steps do I need to get there? I can't just go from here to the finish line, right? I have to take the first step, the second step, the third step. Oh no, something went wrong. I went back to the first step. And that's kind of how it goes, right? So that's dirt bike racing. That was, that was my career. Um, that's something that I just learned at a really pretty young age. Um, and it's almost just like hacking the brain because the brain will help you push you to your next step. If, if you, but if you say, I just hope something works out, your brain tells you, okay, you can just do nothing now and you're, you're okay. Um, but if you expect something out of, out of it, some expect some results, your brain won't give up until it pushes out what that next step should be. So anyway, just wanted to comment on how I like your answer. Yeah, no, it was really good. I like that a lot. Um, the next question for you, Colton. So if you're not real estate investing or you're not riding a motorcycle or you're not hanging out with your family, what other things do you do with your free time? Cause I know you do all those things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I truly, I really, really like, um, <laughs> I like sports in general. Right. So, um, you would think that it's funny cause a lot of dirt bike racers are, are, are completely, um, <laughs> uh, what's the word when you're not, um, they're just awkward with, with other, with other sports, you know, like if they need to throw a ball, you're like, okay, throw me the ball. <laughs> you know, I like, do like, do, did you do, did you do anything other than ride a motorcycle? Like, you know, so that's not me. I, uh, I, I just played every sport. I played every sport growing up. And so I think just in general, just like competition and sport and, um, that's the place that puts my brain into, you know, I always talk about when I ride a motorcycle, um, it just puts me in the now in the moment in the present that when it doesn't do that, I'm really frustrated. Like I know that there's something I'm, I'm not that into my riding that day. If it, if I can't just let go of everything else that I got going on and just focus on that one rock, right. That I don't want to hit and crash on. Um, but yeah, I think that that part, that, that outlet that I get to be in from, from sport, um, is super important. I think for, for everybody, you know, I think, uh, you can be in a grind for, you know, uh, your, with your job and your life and your, uh, in your family and whatever, you know, but I can get on the motorcycle or play a sport and all I'm focused on, um, you know, if I'm playing basketball is just getting the ball in the hoop. I know it sounds elementary and rudimentary, but it's just, dude, like, yeah. It's what a lot of people don't realize out there who don't exercise much or move their body around. I mean, that's why it's like the ultimate um, de-stressor and the ultimate, um, you know, anti-anxiety pill or the ultimate, you know, it will kill any kind of depression that you have temporarily because you're in the now whenever you're moving your body around and exercising or playing or doing some sort of sports because uh, you're not just sitting there pondering and, and dwell, dwelling on the past. Or have an anxiety about what's coming up in the future. You just get to be in the moment, and it's the ultimate stress killer. And I'm going to touch on that just a little bit here, Nick. Um, so Nick and I just got back from Cabo, and we rode ATVs in Cabo through the desert. It was fantastic. Um, so I'm not an extreme sports guy by any means, but like when we were riding the ATVs, like I've I've never felt such a quiet in my own head. Like I'm just like, oh, I'm driving, and I know what I'm doing, and I was I was just in the moment, and I can absolutely attest to what you're saying. That's, that's so good. So yeah. Did anything fun happen on that ATV ride or did we, did anyone roll it or go down? No, they, nothing, uh, they had us crazy? going pretty contained, unfortunately, but, uh, I was in the, I was in last place and there was no one behind me. So what I was doing is I was letting everyone go ahead really far. And then I'd have a long time to just shoot forward and get some speed up real quick. So it was, it was pretty Throw fun. some drifts. Yep. Exactly. It's like, nobody's watching me back here anymore. I guess I can do some things. So that was cool. They knew what you were doing. They knew what you were doing. They were on to you. Yeah. Do you ever play any uh do you ever play any disc golf, Colton? Disc golf. I've never played disc golf. Uh we actually go mountain biking at uh Beacon Hill in Spokane. Really, really cool mountain bike spot. And they have a frisbee golf uh spot there. Um 
Well, maybe we'll uh, we'll take you and Craig Kirlop out disc golfing sometime. That's uh, it's a fun little time to get out and do stuff. So sweet. And then um, last question for you: Where can people find out more about you if they want to follow you on social media or get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, uh, Instagram is pretty easy. Um, so I'm just at Colton Haker, my name. And then I think uh, you know Facebook is is an okay route to um, you know, so you can just you know Facebook Colton Haker, you'll find me on there as well. Um, outside of that, my cell phone number is just kidding, but, uh, my, uh, but you can definitely, that's not true though. You can find my cell phone number pretty easily on lakecdapm.com. So that's, uh, that's our property management website. And, uh, so you can find, um, yeah, you can find my number on there or my, my wife's and that's just the two of us right now running that, running that deal. And so, uh, yeah. And so. If you want to find out information about the property management or uh, want a free consultation or discussion about what you got going on, we'd be happy to, to talk to you. I mean, I just love talking real estate. So at the end of the day, that's all it is for me is just uh, just having another conversation with another person about uh, real estate strategy and uh, and how we can help. That's all it is. I love it. Um, yeah. Nick, any final closing thoughts before we kind of wrap this up? No, we've gone way over our time here. We'll let you go now. No worries. Thank you for being on. Yeah, Colton, this was so good. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, tune in to the next one. See ya. Thank you so much for checking out the Investor Shed podcast. If you enjoyed your time, make sure to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Follow along on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at The Investor Shed for shorts and promos about each episode. Do you want to be a guest or know someone who has great real estate investing advice and stories? Reach out to us at theinvestorshed at gmail.com.